Coming up today, we got Lawrence Gowan. He is the singer and keyboard player for that great 70s band Sticks. Uh, and he also had a very successful solo career, mostly in Canada, that we'll talk about. And he's a pleasure in this interview, a really funny guy. Uh, we discussed the recent residency Sticks had in Vegas with Ann Wilson of Heart and the upcoming tour with REO Speedwagon and Loverboy. We talk about set lists, new music, and so much more. Stay right there. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm okay. That's I, awesome. You know what? It was good. Is I guess I guess that shot verified that I am wearing pants. And that's, <laughs> that's a, that's a, <laughs> yeah, I never thought of that. I guess I could I could be bottomless too this whole time. That's crazy. That, that, that's important in a Zoom meeting to uh, establish that early on. Yeah. What if you forgot and you went to go turn the lights off? That would have been interesting. I'll tell you this: it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know. We had a lot of these with the band over the pandemic year. And so there would be uh, various states of dress and undress that would uh, would enter into the uh, the Zoom call. Oh, really? <laughs> Most of the time on purpose, just to okay. kind of keep it uh, keep it flowing, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be fun. That's not like working in some boring corporation when you're in a rock band and you have meetings. I mean, it's got to be still some serious work to do, but it's more fun than working for Microsoft, I would think. I would say that a, 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 a half hour Zoom call with Sticks is uh, about three, about three to four minutes of of of, of business, and the rest of the time is nothing but um, a pretty impressive comedy that could probably make it onto Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the funniest person in the band? I, it, that goes around the table, honestly. It, some days it. it you know, I, I get a kick out of Todd in, incredibly. You know, I, I find he's got a great sense of humor, and uh, he can usually, uh, especially when you're on a Zoom call, he's got he's got the accoutrement of, the, of all his whole drum room around him, so he can uh, he's got all kinds of ways of punctuating his uh, his humor, uh, if you get what I mean. And um, he can he can do it in the most deliciously annoying way that the, 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 of any human being I've ever encountered. So. Uh, <laughs> We all get a kick out of Todd when he when he goes into that mode. Does he do like the rim shots and stuff? If somebody makes a joke, or so beyond that, I can't. Oh, even, beyond, I, I can't. I can't even begin to describe to you just the. Well, if you've ever seen the drum room that he has, and he lives in Austin, no. Texas, and he has this phenomenal drum shrine. Almost, I mean, it's it's beyond that. I mean, it's a functioning room, but he's got all these snare drums and incredible doodads all around him. So he he can find something to to smack on that can. Uh, Hold your attention. Let's put it that way. I'm picturing like Andy Kaufman with the bongo drums. Remember that? I think that's that's. A, I think you're getting. I think you're getting much closer to the image now. Okay. <laughs> I don't think there's ever been a rim shot. A rim shot would be far too uh, far too tepid. Too basic. Okay. Well, yeah. So you guys just just did some shows, and um, I, I I realized this is already, these shows already happened because I was like, oh, this sounds amazing. I want to go to the Vegas residency with Ann Wilson, and I'm like, oh, that, those shows already happened. So how was it? It was absolutely great. I tell you, it was Nancy was uh, really on form. I, what I was mean, it Nancy Wilson? Sorry. Yeah, it was Nancy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nancy. Um, so we had yet another guitar player in sticks for five songs that night. Uh, she was great. Absolutely. A, a joy to work with. Uh, she had a singer with her by the name of uh, Kimberly Nicole, who also was tremendous uh, singer uh, and those are not easy songs to sing, you know, Barracuda and Crazy on You. And so um, it was really beautiful to bring her out in the middle of, the, of a stick show and suddenly pivot into a into a, a, a heart, you know, a deep dive into the heart catalog for four or five songs. Um, audiences ate it up. All the shows were sold out and uh, we'll probably wind up doing it again. Okay, with her or someone else? Because you've done it, done it with other musicians too, right? We've done it with Don Felder uh, of the Eagles. That was also a wonderful thing. Uh, yeah, it's likely it would be with someone else, but I'd do it again with either one of those two people if if the timing works out. They were both, you know, you know, rock icons, and it was yeah. Great. So they just come up for like five songs. Yeah, we we kind of become their band. You oh. know, what I mean? like we we learn that we kind of. Do a little sticks version 
uh, so to speak, of of what they uh, of their classic songs. You know, we, you know, with uh, with Don Felder, we do uh, Hotel California, obviously, and Life in the Fast Lane, and you know, and with as I mentioned with with Nancy Wilson, you go into those those really quintessential heart songs and and give them a bit of a sticks twist, and uh, next thing you know, people are standing standing up in the in the in the aisles and uh, and dancing around, and it was a great time. Paul McCartney, do you think you could get him to do it? Uh, does he have any good songs? <laughs> one or two. He's kind of a one-hit wonder, but uh, yeah, he's got a couple. Or a one billion hit wonder. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, wouldn't that be wouldn't that be the greatest piece of icing on anyone's cake? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you and then you guys have another tour coming up this summer. Is it sort of the summer one with Ario Speedwagon and Loverboy? Yeah, that's that's the yeah. summer blockbuster. Dude. We're we're in Sandy. Uh, San Antonio, sorry, <laughs> we're in San Antonio today, and uh, for the show tonight. Um, but the summer—that's a stick show. The, the summer tour is us with Ario Speedwagon, who we you know love touring with. That that's always an amazing uh, uh, you know, dual headline situation there. But my Canadian compatriots, um, Lover Boy, are still a spectacular band, and they seriously. They raise the bar every single night they play. So having the three of them on these three bands on, on one bill, I can understand why, why people are so anxious to see this show. And uh, it's going to be a great summer. Yeah. And I, I forget, are you guys coming to Arizona? I'd have to, I'd have to look. I'd love to see. I think you are. I think you're coming like, unfortunately in the summer, which is a tough time to be here. Really? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first, you see, I'm Canadian, right? It's, you know, oh, yeah. They can figure out for my outrageous accent. And um, I remember the first time I was in uh, Phoenix, I had heard it was hot, but <laughs> my Canadian kind of Scottish Canadian uh, skin had never quite experienced that, uh, that, those kinds of conditions. However, I did acclimate to it after a few days. We actually rehearsed the tour there prior to this summer tour. So I got into this 104, 106 degree days. And um, by, by the time we hit the show, I was really kind of enjoying it. So, uh, you know, as long as you're playing in an amphitheater that's somewhat covered, uh, it's it, it just adds to the to the ambience of the whole thing. And I, I'm never really put off by uh, by inclement weather. Next week, I go and play a bunch of solo shows in Quebec. And I can tell you... Uh, this time of year it's um frigid would be a mild way <laughs> yeah no this is the time to come to arizona right now it's perfect so oh, if you want to do love, some solo shows here oh, now oh I, I love going to arizona in the winter time uh, it's just it's beautiful I, in fact we were there just last i think last october no it was yeah september so it was just starting to, to ease off a little bit on the on the heat front. And, and I remember borrowing a bicycle from the hotel uh, and, and just loved riding around the streets and, and just enjoyed the whole experience. It was great. Is there any other favorite cities or venues that you're looking forward to coming to? That's always, you know, I, I'm always going to say that, for example, when, you, when I look at the itinerary and I see, you know, if I see Los Angeles or New York or, you know, Chicago or London, England, or, you know, these are, these are things that pop out at you, but usually by the end of the year, it's, there's always surprise cities that turn out to be the best nights that, that you hadn't anticipated. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reluctant now when I look at the schedule to try to pre determine what's going to be the most exciting place to be, because it really comes down to what happens on that day in that city. I mean, we always know how it ends at the end of the night. It's, it's, it's a, it's a great experience, but sometimes there are, there are other factors that, that, uh, that sort of kick in that, uh, that, that make it even more of a memorable experience. And that's why I, I'm always very reluctant to say what's my favorite place to go. Like what other factors? What do you mean? Well, for example, um, here you go. Last year, when the first show coming out of the pandemic OK, so you've got that sort of mindset. It's the first show back uh, was June the, uh, the, the 12th, and it was in St. Augustine, Florida. I love that that town anyway. But the conditions, you know, being that it was June, it was still beautiful, like really beautiful in Florida. Florida gets quite hot in the summer, too, by the way. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> so 
uh, just the atmosphere of the audience, the anticipation, the, the buildup to wanting to get back to seeing live shows, that coupled with the fact that we had a brand new record, the record that that week, it, the very first release week, it went to number one on Billboard's rock album chart. So that added to the, the whole kind of atmosphere of it that by the time we hit the stage there was such phenomenal anticipation and feeling of emotional release that that really put it right uh, obviously it was, it was the best show that we played to that point in that year because it was the first show we played but <laughs> it was uh, just uh, uh, you know it was a precursor to the fact that that's that's kind of it's been that atmosphere to some degree in all the shows that we've played since uh you know since we've just you know are trying to uh, recover from uh, from a worldwide pandemic, which is uh, hopefully the only time in our lives we'll have to face that. Hopefully. Right. Yeah. Well, the new album, Crash of uh, Crown, it's a newest album, I guess. It's it gets, yeah, it's out now. And yeah. um, you know, it's Tommy Shaw said it was uh, the, the, what he said. Like, they were, were more like a gospel caravan trying to send out positive messages. And you know, one of the songs, Common Ground. That's that's a great idea because that's. Yeah. What, you know, music can do is bring common ground between people because there is some divisiveness coming out right now, too. You know, it's funny. The divisiveness, we're, we're aware of that. We don't we don't highlight that as part of a stick show because we want people to have fun. And we know we know that audiences, you know, they may have their all kinds of reasons why they are divided uh, when they're outside of the, the amphitheater uh, wherever they're seeing us play. But the beautiful thing about music is you see such wonderful harmony and agreement going on in the audience because they all dig the music and that's that's the soundtrack of their lives and it bonds people and it, and it makes us feel a lot better about humanity i mean obviously today we're looking at uh, some of the worst of our uh, existence with what's going on in europe and um and yet i know that tonight i'm going to witness from the stage a wonderful unifying uh uh, moment that is going to uh, that's going to carry me into into the next day and hopefully every member of that audience with a renewed sense of um, of 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 uh, of purpose and, and connection to uh, to each other. Way too lofty a speech I just made there. So <laughs> <laughs> no, that was beautiful. I love that's it. Yeah, I... but quite honestly, that is what happens. You know, no, no that's I won't be cynical. It, it is precisely what happens, and and it breaks down that barrier in me as much as anyone else. You know, you, you begin to lose your faith in there. You know, what, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> and yeah. then you think, well, we're doing some great things when it comes to the arts and music and yeah. technology and things like this that we have enhanced our world with. I kind of feel connected to all of those ideas when we're playing a, a show and particularly in this band, there's something about this group of people that I get to share the stage with every night that, that are really uh, aware of that. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, I've never seen sticks live. I think I got to see this Ario Speedwagon lover boy tour. This sounds like a great package. Now, do you guys do, or maybe it's just when you're just a, you're not touring with anyone else. You do two sets. Explain this to me. I saw this on the set list. It was like 12 songs then a break and then 12 songs. Is there an intermission or something? Chuck, you've never been to a stick show. I'm trying to absorb that. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around it. So, I Chuck, know, I know. I want to welcome you into the massive fold of planet Earth. <laughs> planet Earth, okay, thank you. Please, please come, come to us. Come, come to us. Right, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah, good. So, So here's what we do. We tour in all, because we play usually roughly 100 shows a year, give or take. Sometimes 110, sometimes 90. Roughly 100 shows. We, we mix it up because the venues are different. The circumstances are different and different times of the year. For example, in the wintertime, much like we did with Nancy Wilson, that was a one full-on set show, you know, where she comes up in the middle, and then we got the encores, etc. That makes sense for that. When we're playing theaters in the wintertime, particularly, like we did the last couple of last few nights that we just played in Florida, we were in Tallahassee and Orlando and uh, Fort Lauderdale. For those shows, that was what we call an evening with sticks. And that's where we come out and play an hour, maybe an hour and 10, something like that in the first, in the first set. That gives people kind of a, a chance to kind of get the get the get the vibe up, get the energy going and and, and really feel it. 
we take a short intermission and we come back and play another hour. And the short intermission is maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And hmm. it just kind of, it balances the night in a nice way. We started doing that when, I'll tell you where that came in. In 2010, we did a tour where we played Grand Illusion and Pieces of Eight, two of the, the biggest Sticks records before I was in the band uh, from the 70s. That um, it, it, it called for that, you know, it meant to play the first, play Grand Illusion, take an intermission, come out and play uh, Pieces of Eight. So we started doing that more and more where we dice the set up into, into various eras of the band. With the Mission album that came out in 2017, we played in Las Vegas and did Vegas, Boston, and then next, actually next week we're doing it in New York on Broadway at the Beacon Theater. We play the Mission in its entirety because it's a, it's a, it's a concept album from 2017 that is a whole arc and story that connects to this uh, space adventure. And that's presented on giant screens, et cetera, and you get this kind of spacey, great vibe going that's a great piece to play intact like that. Then we take an intermission, we come back and we bombard them with every sticks hit we can possibly squeeze in in the next hour and a bit. So that that's called an evening with sticks. And that oh. I know that Chuck, you're going to be looking forward to experiencing that at some point in the future. Or you come and see, you know, sticks with um, Ario Speedwagon Lover Boy, or you come and see us. Uh, you know, we played two Super Bowls. Maybe we'll do another one. Come to one of those, but. Either way, I think Chuck Shoot is going to have the most marvelous experience. <laughs> he finally loses his st sticks on his virginity <laughs> and joins the rest of the global sensation of what a sticks concert is. Wow, this is a lot of fun. I just had Ted Nugent on. I thought you were going to be more, you know, Canadian, more polite, more what, you know, more mellow. You're like almost as wild as him. No, first of all, we've toured with 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 Ted. Nugent. Yeah. No, what's happened is my Canadianism is a little bit weathered because I've been hanging around with Americans for so long. <laughs> I've been in the band. Painted party. you. It's funny. No, quite honestly, uh, this is a band that really deserves to be the, the pride that's in this band. It does deserve to be touted. And uh, when I first joined the band, I was much more, as you described, a bit more demure and, and self-effacing when it comes to that sort of thing. But J.Y., I remember meeting him the first time and he just laid it out about how successful and how uh, amazing this band is and how connected to people they are. And I liked, I liked his, uh, I liked his delivery. Hmm. So I'll give you my version of that right now. Yeah, no, it's cool. And it's when I'm doing my research, I didn't realize I feel so stupid. You're like this massive star in Canada. You had all these hit songs that I, we never hear in the U S why do they not play any of those songs in the U S that's so, it's always so bizarre to me. Oh, shucks. I don't know. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, more the Canadian. <laughs> actually, Canadians don't say, oh, shucks. Uh, you know what we say? I'm sorry. I, I don't know. Sorry. That's what. <laughs> oh, anyway, I just, yeah. I, I, I just stereotype my own people. That's yeah. <laughs> Um, We're going to get canceled for this. Um, I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you a quick explanation of, uh, because it's very, it's, it's uh, the music business has changed so dramatically, Chuck, over the, uh -huh. uh, as everyone on, on the planet knows. When I was signed to Columbia Records in Canada in 1982, they were, of course, Columbia Records, as it was uh, CBS Records from the United States, and it was understood that my records would get released in the United States. But the business of music steps in the way and you begin to realize that back then and it's very difficult for young musicians to comprehend this now because you know we can you and i can this thing that we're doing right now is getting a worldwide release if you and i could make to put a song on this phone push send and it gets a worldwide release but back in the in the days when the four major labels of columbia capital a and m and warner brothers uh, warner atlantic um when they were really controlled the entire music industry, really, they were the, they were the, um, you know, the giant superpowers of it. They, they quite uh, cleverly, deftly would divide how much of the, how much they want to flood the market with product. That's what they called it. Right. Hmm. So, as I said, this would be a nice dull answer, very unted Nugent like, uh, <laughs> 
my records, although I, I achieved four platinum, three gold, a platinum single, and a lot, you know, played all the biggest venues uh, across Canada multiple times, uh, they just didn't want to release my records in the United States because they kind of controlled the market. There were only a few Canadian acts that actually got released here. For example, Rush, and part of, I was managed by the same people that managed Rush for 14 years. And they, there was definitely frustration, real frustration when it came to that. Um, you know, I, I did the very first tour that Tears for Fears did of, uh, in America. I, I was fortunate enough to get on the bill on that tour, that was in 1985, and that when they had songs from the big chair out there, and Strange Animal, uh, sorry, my album of that year was number one in Canada, and their album was number one in the United States. It eventually went to number one in Canada as well, of course. But um, I, we really thought this is the turning point where it will it will suddenly happen. And in fact, you know, in Cleveland, Buffalo, you know, places that were close to can to the border. They would hear Canadian airplay, and, and it actually, one of the songs I had got into the top 20 just on import in Cleveland and and, and also in Buffalo, uh, huh. several other border places. So when I go there, even to this day, there are some people that remember things from the 80s that will go, oh, you're going to play A Criminal Mind. Well, luckily, Sticks do play A Criminal Mind. That's one of the songs from my one of my solo years, and sometimes yeah. I get here. So um I hope that was a, a, a somewhat discernible answer. That's basically not everyone got a worldwide release back then. No right. matter how big you were in one country to another. I'll, I'll give you a great example to take it off me. I remember going, I was in England in the 80s, and the Jam, a band called The Jam, were playing Wembley. And then when they came to Canada, they were playing in a club. You see what I mean? Like it's wow. just because their records at that point, I could only get them on import. Yeah, in America, I would find hardly anyone had heard of them. And then, you know, eventually they broke through because they were so strong. But that's how the music industry was then. Now it's 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 actually moving a little bit back toward that, the way that they're manip not manipulating, but the way they're beginning to be the gatekeepers again of, of what gets exposed in one area and another on the Internet. Great thing about music is eventually, if it's any good, it finds its audience. So um, I love when I go home and we'll be playing some Canadian shows and I look out and I can see tons of sticks fans from the U S have, have made this, um, this great uh, journey to, to the North and come to see one of my own shows. So you see, it all, it all, it all works out eventually. Exactly. Well, yeah, I know you got to get going, but I like to always highlight with a charity at the end, um, rock to rescue charity. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. You guys donate the proceeds from signed guitars to a nonprofit. So that began, it wasn't at my instigation, but I was very happy to be part of it and still am. After 9-11, um, we wanted to do something uh, to kind of contribute, particularly to the, we wanted the, the, the families that were affected by, uh, by, by that day. And uh, so Rock to the Rescue was born and we did, um, multiple concerts over the first three years, maybe three or four concerts, uh, where the proceeds went to the, the those families. Well, we began to, you know, think, you know, all these communities, all these cities, all these towns, all these places we go, it'd be great to connect to some local cause on the day that we're there. So a simple thing to do was keep, because Rock to the Rescue had become a charitable foundation, I guess, or registered, whatever it is, um, we would sign guitars or memorabilia or these sorts of things and auction them off prior to shows so that some money will go to whoever is the worthy cause of the day. So sometimes it's an animal shelter. Sometimes it's a homeless shelter. Sometimes it's a kind of a, you know, a, a, a food for, you know, a food bank or something, things of this nature that, um, that, that are deemed deserving in, in that community. So it's a way of us kind of connecting ourselves there and saying, you know, thanks for keeping us going. And, uh, Here's, here's something uh, we can uh, give back, as they say. I, I'm not crazy about that expression. It's just, it's something we can do that's a good thing for those communities. Yeah, that's great. I love it. Well, thanks so much. Uh, so people can check out the new album. It's available now. Uh, yep. what, I forgot the name already. Crown Crash of the Crown. Crown. Crash of the Crown. Crown. I was going to say it wow. wrong. And then, of course, you're on tour. You're doing solo dates, Sticks dates, solo or just with Sticks, and then Sticks with Ario Speedwagon and Loverboy this summer. And I got to see one or all three of those. 
Where are you, Chuck? Where are you? Scottsdale, Arizona. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You said Arizona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, I love you got that Beatles thing on the behind you there. And yeah. Cool. Actually, yeah, that's that's very cool. I like what you got going on there. All right. Yeah. This, of course, is just a set that I put together prior to us. I'm is this your hotel room? No, I'm sitting out in a parking lot. I, I bring this set with me everywhere I go. And, <laughs> the green uh, screen? Yeah, that, I, that's what it is. Yeah, it's a green screen. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I look forward to seeing you guys live, and uh, I'll be doing the Mr. Roboto dance for you. Will you please? Yeah. Uh, someone has to do it. Yeah, I'll come up on stage, and I'll embarrass myself. It'll be great. Yep. This is just a prop. I'm going to use this to guide you. All right. <laughs> All right. Have Ready? a good one. Thank yeah, you. Nice to see you. We'll see you at a stick show soon. Three, two, one, and scene. Bye. <laughs> Lawrence Gowan, he is the man. Sticks is the band. Check them out on tour with Loverboy and Ario Speedwagon this summer, unless, of course, you're listening to this in the future and then you missed out. So make sure to follow Lawrence and Sticks on social media to keep up with new music and tour dates and other news so you don't miss out. And, of course, follow me on social media, too, so you can keep up with new episodes. I've got some great guests lined up for the show. I've got a good variety. I've got an actor coming up. I've got an author. And, of course, there'll be tons of musicians as well. And besides following me on social media, if you want to support the show, please give us a high rating or a review wherever you listen. And if you're on YouTube, hit uh, the like button and the subscribe button. That will help me out. Uh, We recently went over 1,000 subscribers on YouTube So I just want to say thank you to everyone that did subscribe and shared the show. That really helped me out. And uh, with your support, we can continue to grow and I can bring you exciting guests and keep making more shows. And it's a lot of fun. So again, thank you. I want you to have a great rest of your day and remember to shoot for the moon.